hey what's up guys so with the changes come to affliction in temple 1.5 and we hit the sub goal over on the twitch twitch.tv slash arson you should come hang out i decided it was best time to make a guide for affliction and mythic plus i want to start off with saying a lot of this is my own personal preference i'm constantly trying new builds trying new things so i suggest you do the same i'm going to present several different builds to you and i encourage you to try different ones and see which one works best for you especially mythic plus there's a lot of different situations between four and tyrannical and between all the different dungeons this season as especially as affliction we got to do a lot of different things to keep up with everybody else so i hope i can share some info with you maybe you want to play affliction maybe you don't either way i hope i can i can help you out in this guide i'm going to go over the changes to affliction in 10.1.5 stats and gear how i sim for mythic plus my talents rotation my ui and lastly some just general tips and tricks from dungeon to dungeon and just in general before we jump into it everything's going to be split up in sections so if you want to just jump around feel free so starting off with the changes, in 10.1.5, Affliction is getting some solid buffs and some amazing quality of life changes. The dev note says they felt Affliction setup took a bit too long to get going and they wanted to reduce that, which is 100% true and I hard agree. This is great because it's a big part of the setup blow. If you're running Dread Touch, one of the main reasons I hated playing it in dungeons, it took four Raptors to get online and then if your target died or your UA fell off that target, you had to do it all over again. So, they replace it with the new talent, Xavier's Gambit. UA deals 15-30% to 30 increased damage, you know, it's got two ranks. Xavier's Gambit is located exactly where Malefic Affliction was, just above Dread Touch, or Doom Blossom, which we're going to talk about soon. UA's damage is just flat increased by 10%, that's amazing. And then Dread Touch has been fully redesigned. Malefic Rapture causes targets suffering from UA to take 30% additional damage from your damage over time effects for 8 seconds. So, it's literally the same thing that old Dread Touch was, except it doesn't take four Raptures to get there. We can just Rapture once when we have UA on the target, and we get the same buff. So now we just have a flat damage to UA if we take Xavier's Gambit, plus the 10% buff that's going to be on top of that, and our Dread Touch just activates on the target with the first Rapture. This is huge quality of life for us, especially in Mythic Plus. Usually we would favor this on Tyrannical Weeks, but it was almost always a pain most of the time to either keep active on the target, or if you ever had to swap targets, think of like Brackenite Hollow. But when we're running Dread Touch now, we just put UA on the target, one Rapture, already online, easy. Next is the Doom Blossom change. So basically, as long as you have UA on the target and you seed, you're just going to do extra splash damage. This adds a lot more consistent damage to our AoE profile instead of having to rely just on Dark Lair, Grim Reach, or Soul Rot. So, if you're running this with Grim Reach, our AoE damage is actually pretty absurd. And then last, but not even remotely least, Seed of Corruption's base cast time has been reduced to 2 seconds from 2.5. This is probably my favorite change just in general. All the other things are fantastic, but my base cast time of seed is now 1.5 seconds. That feels incredible to play now. Before, there were several times where I would have to just use Malefic Raptures to not overcap on shards. Now we can just keep seeding. It's easy. Overall, these changes are great. A huge boost to Affliction, in my opinion, and a fantastic step in the right direction. So let's talk about crafted items. So if you haven't already crafted your embellishments, and you haven't crafted anything and you're just sitting on a bunch of sparks or whatever those new ones are called now <laughs> uh craft a weapon first haste mastery so either a one-hander or a two-hander depending on what you have uh, or you want doesn't in my opinion it doesn't really matter but so what i mean here is if you only have two sparks of shadow flame and you need to craft two things you don't necessarily have to craft a two-handed weapon maybe craft just a one-hander and then another piece the two-hander clearly is going to have more stats and if you can't get a, an offhand or you don't have an offhand maybe consider doing the two-hander however you can always craft an offhand later or maybe pick one up from one of the dungeons. That's why I think when I made mine, I went with a one-hander and then I crafted a piece with a Shadow Flame embellishment on it just to give me a little bit more damage now. And then I can upgrade to the two-hander later or just craft the offhand. Uh, then next should be your embellishment crafts. So that's either your Lariat and a Shadow Flame or two Shadow Flames. So if you already have your tier piece, maybe go, you know, Shadow Flame on shoulders and then Lariat or Shadow Flame on shoulders and then like an off piece that also has Shadow Flame on it. It's definitely personal preference. I kind of swap between the two because I've already crafted a bunch of things. Next, after you've gotten all of your embellishments and your weapon, I would then maybe do like a ring that has flavor pocket on it. That just, you know, gives you your food buff the entire time. Uh, and then any other crafts that you can do that will give you higher idol level, right? So maybe you craft boots that have haste mastery on them or you craft, you know, bracers or something like that. But anything that you can craft that's just going to give you higher item level, that's where you're going to want to go, and you're always going to want to favor Haste Mastery. So let's talk about gear. So, uh, we're going to be running our 4-piece, right? 4-piece is great. Especially with the Catalyst out now, you should be able to get your 4-piece online pretty quickly. 4-piece uh, is basically just increased damage on my Vile Taint, 
and we're getting you know we get reduced cooldown vials and that's pretty much all you need to care about that um like i said before you're gonna be running shadow flame on at least two shadow flame embellishments or lariat and one shadow flame that's pretty much what i prefer uh as far as trinkets are concerned i prefer spoils over everything as far as my on use just because it lines up perfectly with dark lair every time and then obviously our warlock trinket is just incredible you should get your warlock trinket if you can if you cannot get your warlock trinket or you haven't gotten it yet chromatic essence is a fantastic second choice it's just flat damage uh idle pure decay isn't bad either that's also just more flat damage it's just a you know just passive damage amp uh flowstone is fine i wouldn't recommend it but if it's all you got just run it it's totally fine but definitely try and get your hands on spoils if you can um, if you want to use Fragment instead, that is also okay, except I personally don't care that it has a 3 minute versus our 2 minute with Dark Lair. It just usually creates like a really weird overlap. So for a quick recap, eye level, always sim your character, then focus towards haste mastery, craft your weapon first, then embellishments, then any off pieces that will give you an eye level bump with main stat, or then go rings. There are a bunch of great trinkets for us this tier from raid and from dungeons, but spoils plus class trinket and Eltharian's Call of Dominance is definitely my favorite combo. And if you can't get the class trinket, then Ominous is obviously a great choice, and anything else that you can get your hands on is probably going to be fine until then. Okay, so let's talk about how to sim. So first off, you're going to make sure you install the Simulation Craft add-on so that you can grab this string from your character. Just slash sim C and then copy and paste that string into this box. Then we're gonna scroll down. We're gonna select whatever we wanna compare. I'm just doing the gear compare option, but you can do just a quick sim or whatever. So we're just gonna pick some different pieces of gear that we want. It's gonna tell me I have like a like a conflict here because I'm currently trying to equip multiple uh, embellishments that I can't equip. So we'll select a few different pieces or whatever. The big thing that's happening here that I wanna talk about is how to select shit, like options down here. So. I turn off every raid buff and then I will usually change it around how I like to think about different pulls in Mythic Plus. So you're going to fight a bunch of bosses, right? <laughs> usually a boss is about three minutes depending on the boss fight. So this is a pretty good average. And we're also simming without lust. So right, we're trying to get the baseline. Um, then I'll also switch it to five bosses like 40 seconds. That'll give us another baseline of how we usually see some pulls. Not many pulls are, you know, more than five bosses or five mobs, right? Just think of bosses as in mobs. And then sometimes I'll do like eight bosses, like three to five minutes, depending on what I'm trying to see, to give me an idea of just the key as a whole. Or like a big, big pull that, I mean, there's not gonna be very many pulls that are three minutes. So that's just what I wanna kinda talk about was just ideas around it. Don't use these other options. I don't think a lot of the stuff is built for these other options for correctly for how the character plays or how this, you know the whole system is set up behind. So just use patchwork. One boss, three minutes for, you know, bosses. Use like five bosses, 40 seconds or one minute. 40 seconds seems to be a pretty, pretty solid one. And then, you know, do like eight bosses, like three minutes. So I just want to start this off with saying I am on the PTR, but let's go over some of the like talent builds that I think uh, we're going to be running. And I'll talk a little bit about each talent. Just, you know, assuming that you don't, you've never played Affliction before. Uh, so Malefic Rapture is our main spender, right? That's our first point. That is our main spender. It scales off of how many dots we have on our target. So when we're going into our burn phase, which I'll talk a little bit more about more in uh, our rotation section, the the whole gist of it is we want to keep and stack as many dots on our main target as we possibly can when we want to spend Raptures, right? So we're going to go to Seed of Corruption. This is our main spender when we're trying to do AoE damage. Basically just cast seed when you want to do aoe usually when there's four or more targets is when i'm casting seed of corruption if there's three targets because we're running so seeds i will usually just throw out one seed to apply corruption to everything uh, again we're running so the seeds to just add two more seeds when we whenever we run seed of corruption uh we're running uh, unstable affliction this is like one of our main you know bread and butter spells just keep it on your target your main target at all times it can only be on one target but a lot of things happen based upon what our ua is on we'll talk about it when we get down the tree but UA is one of our main uh, abilities as well. Rise and Agony just makes our Agony start at four stacks and scale all the way up to 18 stacks versus the base, which I, I think is like 12 or something like that. Uh, it doesn't matter, you're gonna run this always. Uh, Kindled Malice just incre increases our Rapture damage and our Seed of Corruption damage, right? So Rapture is our main thing, Seed is our main AoE thing. Great, love that. Uh, Vile Taint is, it is tied directly to our tier 
So our tier, you know, Vile Taint's cooldown is reduced by five seconds. Uh, Phantom Singularity, same thing. Vile Taint and Phantom also increased by 60%. And then any enemies that we hit with Vile Taint or that we have Phantom on take 10% increased damage, right? Uh, pretty much in all Mythic Plus, you're going to be running Vile Taint. There are a few times where you can run Phantom Singularity on like Tyrannical Weeks, but I always prefer Vile Taint. It's not just for AoE. It does apply to our single target. It's fantastic. Uh, we are running Siphon Life because, again, our main spender, Malik Rapture, scales off of how many dots we have. Our Dark Claire also scales off of how many dots we have. So Siphon Life is just an extra dot. You're only really ever going to apply this to your main target. You're not going to go into an AoE situation and just apply a bunch of Siphons. That You're not going to do that. Um, we're running uh, Nightfall, which is just a proc that makes our Drain Soul like drain faster. We just slurp everything quicker, which is good because we want to apply Shadows and Brace to the target, which makes them take basically 9% more damage. We're only going to really do this to our main target. I'm going to talk about something I figured out a little bit earlier as well. So we're running Drain Soul. This is just your main like filler spell that we have. Um, you can drop this if you just want to run Shadow Bolt, but the big part about Drain Soul is that you can snipe enemies that are low to give you shards, right? So um either try and get shards from low enemies like i said or there's certain situations in some of these keys where you can get some you know some cheeky little shards so uh last boss in under rot the spores sometimes if i'm low on shards i'll just drain a couple spores that are happening close to us and get a bunch of free shards right there's a bunch of situations like that where you should try and always be looking if you can maybe get a couple free shards um we're gonna run focus malignancy this is mainly just to get us down to the other two nodes we have to spend points down here but it's also solid right well if rapture just deal 30 to increase damage to targets afflicted by ua right we're always gonna have ua on our main target creeping death is also kind of just a mandatory our main dots just deal damage faster not necessarily tick faster they just deal damage faster right so kind of ticking faster just just know that it's good <laughs> haunt again does more damage uh, increases the damage that our target takes but it also adds an additional dot for our additional dot for our rapture scale off of and our dark layer scale off of right riding bolt shadow bolt drain soul deal 50 percent increased damage up to 45 percent per damage over time this is just this was a like uh conduit back in shadowlands this is just a solid staple we always take this don't don't take points out of this uh soul rot again an additional dot for us to scale off of and it does some extra damage um, this build in particular runs the new talents avius gambit that's why i'm on the ptr showing you guys this uh, UA just deals straight up 30% increased damage. That's fantastic. Don't have to do anything like previously. We just, instead of having to do four raptures to get there, it just does flat 30% increased damage. And then this is the new Dread Touch, right? So again, instead of having to do four raptures, we just now do one rapture and we get Dread Touch on our target. Uh, I am running, in this build in particular, this is running <coughs> Malevolent Visionary. So Dark Lair increases damage by an additional 5% per dot. And then Dark Lair lasts an additional 10% or 10 seconds. And then Grim Reach, 50% of our damage that our Dark Lair does, does it to all enemies afflicted by our dots. That includes our main target, right? So this is just a pretty staple build that I think we're going to be running in a lot of Mythic Plus scenarios. Um, it kind of just covers both your bases, right? It doesn't really necessarily have super consistent damage. We're kind of reliant on our two minute Dark Lair for our heavy AoE situation. And then uh, Dread Touch for our like single target. But this isn't a bad build by any means, and I'm definitely going to be giving it a shot in a lot of scenarios going into next uh, into next patch. All right, the next build I want to talk about just uses uh, Doom Blossom. So we're dropping the Grim Reach and Level Visionary, but we're picking up uh, Solar's Gluttony, which basically every time UA deals damage, it reduces the cooldown of Soul Rot. Usually just makes it line up with things a little bit better. Uh, and then we're grabbing Dark Harvest for increased haste and crit, depending on how many targets we hit. And then obviously Xavius Gambit, uh, but then we're picking up the new Doom Blossom. So as long as we have UA on our target and we seed that target as our main target, uh, we'll do like splash damage around it, right? Uh, basically, this is a lot of consistent AoE. So this would be more of like a like a fortified setup. Um, you you still have solid single target because Xavius Gambit, right? And we're still running Haunt. We still have to summon Dark Lair. So your your single target is still fine. Uh, but this is much more lean towards consistent AoE damage. This is one of the builds that I want to give a try to because I feel like it's going to play, it's probably going to feel very nice. And just from the little bit of testing I've done, you kind of just always have AoE damage, but definitely want to keep an eye on. So the other variant of that, instead of running the same row, again, for all these, we're kind of just running the same top half here, but we're swapping over to here. Um, this is just Haunt, Seize Vitality, Haunted Soul. So Seize Vitality increases uh, Haunt damage by 20%. And then it heals us when it comes back. Not the biggest deal. But then the biggest part is Haunted Soul makes every mob around our main haunt mob take 20% increased damage. Or just basically takes 20% increased damage from all of our dots. Um, and so we're running Doom Blossom. So 
these two work again similar to how this one worked in the other build except a little bit more consistent as well so it's kind of like what flavor do you want do you want to run the soul rot version or do you want to run the haunted soul version i i don't know the answer for this but i kind of like both of them so i would definitely say maybe just try either one and see if one feels better than the other to you and lastly i'm going to talk about just the full send it aoe build right so that's we're running doom blossom we're running grim reach this is just max aoe um so one thing you might have noticed in like all the builds i just talked about pretty much from here up all of these stay the same there's a couple situations that i will talk about in the tips and tricks but that will drop one point of soul flame and just grab soul swap and then we're going to be making it you know we're going to grab these four and then we're going to be making our differences from here so i don't know if you're going to run on doom blossom maybe go like haunted soul or maybe you go more of visionary go grim reach you know that's where we're going to kind of be changing things up and that's why i was kind of talking about one of the beautiful things about this spec to me is there are several different builds that all bring different things to the table but all play kind of different and still feel amazing so with the new doom blossom that's just added an additional variant on top of that and Honestly, I'm very excited to see where these different builds go. I'm going to have a link to every single build I talked about in the description. I definitely encourage you to try all of them. Personally, in my opinion, I'm going to be trying just the full send of AoE one, obviously, because I really enjoy running Grim Reach, uh, and then the Dread Touch variant. And then I'm kind of leaning towards the like Soul Rot Dark Harvest build, but the Haunted Soul version of like the, the Doom Blossom one, so like this build, I think this is going to be a very solid just all around uh, Fort Week build. And then you'll just change to like Dread Touch depending on the situation. Um, and like I said, we, we run Soul Swap in a couple situations. I really like it for the last boss in Vortex Pinnacle. Um, it kind of lines up perfectly. And then uh, for last boss of Bracken Hyde, for the Totem, you kind of have it for every other. I'll talk about the tips and tricks, but I kind of just want to go over some different ideas for how these different builds are and just kind of talk about each build and give you an idea of kind of, you know, let you make your own decision on the situation that you want. Okay, so to quickly wrap that up, there's gonna be five different builds that I plan on playing next patch. Import links are all in the description. All of these, I believe, have their strengths and weaknesses. However, until I can try all of these in different keys, I can only speculate on what I know is gonna be good. But if you just want a baseline build to start off with, I suggest the Dread Touch Crim Reach build. You'll have solid single target damage with Dread Touch and great AoE whenever you have Dark Lair. If you want more consistent AoE damage for maybe four weeks, run the Doom Blossom variant. It'll be almost the identical build, but just with Doom Blossom, so a little bit more AoE. And I would suggest Dark Harvest for lower keys, Haunted Soul for higher keys, because Haunted Soul usually gains more value the longer targets are alive, especially in AoE. But I encourage you to try all of them and see which one you like better. That's the beauty of the spec. Or if you want to go full fort, go Doom Blossom with either Soul Rot and Dark Harvest, or Doom Blossom and Haunted Soul. I'll be sure to make a follow-up for this, letting you all know what builds I think are best. But until then, if you want to know what I think, be sure to subscribe here and come by the Twitch, twitch.tv slash arson. Okay, I'm going to do the full single target rotation and just show it off. I'm not currently running Dread Touch. It doesn't change the rotation anymore. It used to, but, you know, with a new patch, it doesn't change it anymore. So, we're going to open with Haunt. We're going to UA. We're going to Agony. We're going to Corruption. We're going to Siphon Life. And then we're going to Drain Soul to get our, our Shadows Embrace up to three stacks. Then we're going to Vile Taint, Soul Rot, pop our Trinket, Potion, Dark Glare, and then we're just going to move a Rapture Spam. One, two, I'm going to make sure I keep one Shard. We're going to catch this Haunt before it falls. Got a Nightfall proc, going to spend it. Going to spend this Rapture. Going to catch that. Catch that Corruption before it falls. Catch that Siphon Light before it falls. Catch our UA before it falls. Spin the Shard. Drain in between, right? Always be doing something. Don't just stand there. And then we're just, gonna, then we're just catching our Dots, right? Keeping our stuff up, keeping all this going. Vile Taint's back up. I want to sit for a second because I want to get one more shard before I spin that shard on the Vile Taint, right? So I can use at least one Malefic Rapture, right? And that's basically it, guys. That's the whole thing. We're just keeping dots up and then we're conserving shards to spend when we have Vile Taint up and when we have Soul Rod up and keep everything going, right? That's the whole thing. All right, so let's get into the AoE rotation, right? So one of the things I like to do when we have like five or more mobs, especially, especially for running Grim Reach because our Dark Lair scales off of how many dots we have on our main target. It's like to set a focus target just so I can keep track of the main target that I have all of my like heavy dots on for the Dark Lair scale off of, right? So that's our Haunt, our Siphon Life, our UA. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open with a seed and then we're gonna immediately cast a Haunt right after that, right? And then I'm gonna Vile Taint, I'm gonna Soul Rot, I'm gonna pop my, my Trinket, 
I'm going to UA, I'm going to Siphon Life, and then I'm going to Dark Glare. And then we're going to go right back into just Seed Spam, right? Um, if we got a Nightfall proc, I'm shipping that to get those stacks on our main target there. And then I'm just I'm just spamming Seed. I'm not even worried about keeping like any shards. I'm just trying to get as many Seed casts as I can out, right? So this is on live servers right now before the PTR hits. I'm going to do a side-by-side -side and show you how much faster this is. But then we're going to just, just going to catch our agonies, right? And then um, we're just going to keep trying to, you know, Vile Tain's back off cooldown now. So that's that weird little gap I was mentioning before where we're going to try and just, you know, catch as many agonies as we can. And then we're just going to keep dumping seeds, right? And that's pretty much the whole rotation. We're just catching, after we do that full intro of our little bit, we're just, you know, catching dots and then spamming seeds and just trying to dump as many shards as you can. That's the whole thing. So let's talk about the UI. So my base UI is just Elf UI, and it's just a profile that is available in the Discord. Um, that's basically everything you're seeing here, except for the plater, or except for the, the nameplates, which is plater, uh, which is a profile that is not mine. That's based on Now's profile, so you should check him out if you're interested in that one. I'm currently working on my own profile, but just a little ways from out on that. The Elf UI profile does come with the plater pro or with a like nameplate profile that works totally fine. Or you can pick up Now's. Highly recommend it. It is great. Um, the other thing is there's some weak ores that I made. So this is a Warlock uptime bar also available on Discord. It just tracks like useful information for each spec, Demo and Destro and Affliction obviously. Uh, so like Nightfall procs or like a Nettle Demise stacks if you're running that or uh, Soul Rot, you know, all those kind of things. There is like some old stuff in there from like previous Dread Touch and stuff like that. But pretty much anything including like Trinkets, Soul Burn, all that kind of stuff is just all kind of just stored in here. Quick little easy pop up to track all that kind of stuff. There's a few other little things I track. Oh, again, some more stuff from now. He's got fantastic stuff, highly recommend it. It's only available to his subs, but definitely go check him out. He's, all of his stuff is fantastic. His like Mythic Plus stuff, highly recommend it. I use OmniCD to track party cooldowns. That's what you're seeing right next to the nameplates of the party members. And then I also use it to track our kicks for the party too. So you can see whose kicks on cooldown. I can see who has what kick and how long until their kick comes back up. Uh, I'm also using Warp Deplete for my timer. So my favorite thing that it gives is it gives pull by pull count percentage. So if your tank pulls a specific amount of mobs, you can see how much that entire pull is worth to your total that you need. It basically just gives you quick information on what is happening in each pull and how much each pull is worth. And then obviously just easy to read timers. Overall, my entire UI is meant to just be minimal and clean and just information that I need to know right now. So that's why I'm only tracking cooldowns. I'm only tracking uh, specific in, like dots that I want to see. All of my instant cast abilities or casted abilities like Drain Soul or my you know Agony, Corruption, all those things, I just they're on bars, but they're hidden away because I don't need to see that information on my screen. I only want to know the information that has a cooldown on it or that I'm currently trying to track, right? So Siphon Life, UA, Haunt, those things I want to track. Malefic Rapture is just kind of there because I'm used to it. Same with Seed, I'm just used to it being there. But the basic way that I like to lay out my UI is just the things that I need to see on my screen at that time and nothing else. If you have a bunch of extra stuff on your screen, a bunch of extra bloat that's maybe just taking up real estate to take away from what you need to be paying attention to, I think that's not worth the, the screen space at all and I think you should get rid of it. So you don't have to try my UI, but maybe just take these tips and maybe slim down what's on your UI, move some things around and just track the things that you need to keep track of because Affliction's got several things we need to be keeping track of. Try not to put too much extra stuff on there that you don't need. So for the tips and tricks section, I'm going to start off with just some general tips for Warlock and Mythic Plus. And then I'm going to go dungeon by dungeon and tell you specific things that I like to do as Affliction per dungeon. All right, first up, it might sound funny, but use your cooldowns. Sometimes shipping it instead of holding on to it is almost always better. If you don't have it for another situation, well, now you know, make a mental note of it. But we have two minute cooldowns. So most of the time in most keys, you are safe to just ship that cooldown. There are a few times where you might hold it for Warlock Trinket or something, or if you know boss is coming next or whatever. But in most cases, just send your cooldowns. A lot of people fall into this pitfall where they're holding their cooldowns for the perfect pull or for this or for that. Just send it. Eventually you will get used to when your cooldowns line up with what. And if it doesn't line up for something, you can make a mental note of it. 
but for the most part, use your cooldowns as much as you possibly can. Next, this is more of just a general like rotational tip, but if you're running Soul Rot and Vile Taint and you're going into either AoE or single target rotation, try and sync those two up whenever you can and maybe even pull a few shards for when you're going into that phase, right? Our Malefic Rapture does more damage depending on how many dots we have on the target. So if we have Soul Rot and Vile Taint on the target, we would love to dump more shards during that window than just using one and then the other, but sometimes it doesn't always work that way. Still try and use them as efficiently as possible, but trying to sync everything up for those windows is really, really important. Use your utility as much as you possibly can. Use your kick as much as you can. Keep your curses up if you can use them. Curse of Tongues, Curse of Exhaustion, both fantastic. Use your Shadow Fury when you can. Use your Halotera if you're running that, or use Mortal Coil if you're running that but using your utility to make a difference in your key is very important. If you're noticing that maybe you're overlapping or you're missing kicks, maybe try and play as like a backup kick for your group since we do have a longer kick than most melees, but just try and use your kick as much as you possibly can and all of your other utility that you bring. So one of the tips I also wanna give is, affliction can be a little complicated at times, especially in like big AOE pulls where you have a lot of dots rolling, you're trying to manage your main target, you're trying to keep you know an eye on dark glare all these things happening while also dodging everything on the ground and then sometimes you may be worried about keeping certain agonies up or whatever in those situations just mainly focus on that main target right the one that has your haunt and your ua because everything is kind of branching from that target so maybe pick a specific one that's going to have more health in the middle of that pack but that's our focus target that's literally where we're focusing everything because that's if we're going to ship dark glare here this is also where we're putting dark glare there so if you know maybe try and catch a couple agonies if you can but if you're really just struggling with a bunch of things and managing all that just focus that one target keep your dots on that one target use file taint to apply everything else to everything else don't worry about keeping the agonies up on the other targets just focus that main target spread your seed of corruption around and then build from there before we jump into the dungeon specific things i figured something on the ptr that shadows embrace does currently seem to affect the damage that doom blossom does so as long as you have Shadows Embrace on your main target, where your UA is, and you Seed of Corruption on that target, it does increase the damage of Doom Blossom on all targets. So this means, if you get a Nightfall proc going into your AoE rotation, you should ship that Nightfall proc to get the three stacks on your main target, then UA, then start your Seed Spam, because it will increase your damage with Doom Blossom. Keeping Shadows Embrace on your main target is a pretty good rule of thumb just in general, but this does have a direct impact on Doom Blossom damage. So for this next section, I'm gonna go through pretty much every dungeon and talk about little specific things I like to do here and there. So this might be a little bit long. I'm gonna break into every different dungeon in the section so you can just jump around if you want to. Starting with Brackenhide Hollow. Okay, so for all the trash up to essentially first boss, I'm always going to be focusing the War Scourge. All of my stuff is gonna be branching off of there. I'm gonna be keeping UA, Haunt, everything on that main target and then just spreading everything from there. Also to help watch with kicks because that fear cannot go off. Also try and use your Shadow Fury to stop the fighters from finishing their cast of Vicious Claw Mangle. It'll make them leave the group and they basically fixate on one target and if it's not stopped they will more than likely kill that target. So that needs to be stopped always. Okay so for first boss nothing really too crazy. I like to set my teleport up in the back of the room just in case I get hard focus. But I use Seed of Corruption to help spread corruption on the three targets. And then depending on what your group wants to your main focus target, just kind of use that as your main and then spread everything off of there and then just dump raptures. Because I'm already running soul swap in this dungeon for last boss, I also use soul swap on first boss to immediately swap everything onto the hex trick totem so it dies as soon as possible. Also, you should be very conscious of the second bleed that you get. If you have dwarf racial, you can just dwarf it off. If you don't, then you should definitely use defensives on that second bleed. Your healer will have lust for the first bleed more than likely and have stuff for it. The second one is when you're going to have some problems. All right, so for tree boss, uh, pretty much the only thing I like to do here is I like to set up my teleport on the edge of the room, depending on where your tank is going, because when he does this little slurp in thing, you can just teleport away. You never have to stop casting. Also, trying to sync your vile taints up with hitting all the slimes is perfect and snipe them with drain soul for free shards. All right, so for stink breath, the mob at the top of the bridge, when he casts Stink Breath, if it's on you, you can line of sight it to cancel the cast. So I like to set my teleport up behind the tree or anywhere that's going to make me line of sight from wherever the tank is having the mob at. And if it focuses me, I teleport instantly, it cancels the cast. For Gutshot, nothing too crazy here. Position yourself behind the trap so if the dogs jump to you, they get trapped. 
Spread your dots with seed on the dogs. Snipe them for shards. Nothing too crazy. Blast away. Okay, so for the last boss, Wrath Eye. What I like to do is I run Soul Swap. So I can Soul Swap every other totem. Uh, sometimes if you can line the cooldown up a little bit, you might be able to Soul Swap every single one, but usually it's consistent every other. For first totem, I skip Soul Swap, so because we have Lust. But then after that, I do every other totem. And then I will also conserve Shards and Nightfall proc if I have it to just have a few more raptures after we soul swap, because that'll basically confirm that we kill it instantly. And if you're running reduced cooldown on soul rot, you will have soul rot for every single swap. Next up, the under rot. So depending on how your tank pulls, always ship everything on the matron and then focus all of your stops and stuns on the maggot. Never let a maggot cast finish. If you absolutely have to, you can fear it to stop that cast from happening. But other than that, kick anything you can and then branch off of the matron. Okay, so on first boss, Elderly Axa, I keep Curse of Tongues on her, and then I'll throw it on the ad when it comes out. But then I just keep all of my main dots on her, and then just put Agony and Corruption on the off target. Help with kicks if you're noticing one is missing the other. Okay, so for all the trash up in the Kragma room, always keep something on the Blood Swarmers, whether it's Curse of Tongues or Exhaustion if you can. Never let a Maggot cast go off if you got something for it. Try and keep focus on the Lashers if you can, because don't let any Decaying Mind cast go off. And then stop any Blood Swarmer cast if you can also help with those. For Kragma, I like to keep my teleport right up next to the bones where most tanks are going to be tanking it so that you can help just bait into that. And then you can also quickly get back from when you have to go out into the middle and stomp worms or whatever. Nothing too crazy about this boss. Just try and keep your dots up as best as possible. Prepare for when you go into Tantrum to maybe get your UA or anything you're not going to be able to cast back onto the boss early. So that you don't have to worry about your dots falling off while you're trying to help stomp out the worms. The only tip I have for Spore Caller is to just put your port in the middle so that when you have to run out, you can just easily drop your upheaval and then teleport quickly back to the middle, go back to your DPS rotation. For last boss, Unbound Abomination, there's a few little things we can do here. So you should always be stacked up with your group so that you guys can just move through his feet when he does this little frontal cast. But try not to move too early because the pools that he spawns from the frontal spawn on top of you where you were. So I like to go about halfway through his cast, run through his legs. But if the boss is too close to the wall or facing too close to the wall, they will sometimes bounce. So try and make sure you give yourself a little bit of extra room. Then the last tip I can give you, there are spores all around this room that will give you shards. So if you're ever super starved for shards, just hit quick drain souls on some spores, help you out. Especially if there's spores starting to get too close to your group, just snipe them for shards so that you guys don't get random spores just spawning on you and just one-shotting you. Next up, freehold. So for the first pull of Freehold, I like to focus target the Enforcer and then just kind of just ship everything on that mob. Since it does have more health, it's much easier to just keep everything focused on that one target. And then even if your tank has to kite, you can still easily keep everything going. There's a few things that I like to do for Sky Captain Crag. So I stay on the outside of the arena and usually put my port outside of the edge because the bird can only go so far, basically where the rocks are. Every time the bird dashes, it will immediately do its Vile Bombardment, so I'm always prepared. As soon as the bird finishes dash, I just start moving so I don't get hit by the Vile Bombardment. You can just stay completely out of the arena and avoid the bird dash, and then continue moving as soon as you see Vile is about to go off, because you don't want to even take a single tick of damage from that if you can help it. For Council of Captains, there's a couple things you can do. I like to put my port at one of the corners of the room where Yodora jumps to because then I can just easily port behind her and I don't have to worry about moving. You can also line a sight at any of the pillars around the room. So when she jumps into like the far left corner, you can just hide behind that pillar if she ever goes to do her shot on you or if she does pistol shot. Keep all of your main dots on Eudora and then keep Agony and Corruption on Raul and then just focus Eudora down. There will be blue circles on the ground that give a buff if you stand in them. If you get targeted with Blackout Barrel, you can Soul Burn Teleport before the Barrel Cast to completely immune it. For all of the trash in between Ring of Booty and the rest of the dungeon, try and just use as many stops as you can. If you get Harpooned in, immediately Howl, it'll usually save your life. Uh, if the Crushers are in the pool, put Haunt and all of your main dots on the Crushers and just cleave off of them. They have way more health than everything else. For Trothak, there's a couple things you can do. I like to use my Teleport and Gate, and I just set them up in the back of the room. And then if a shark ever gets thrown on you, just be on the opposite end of your Teleport and instantly teleport away. And then you can do the same thing if a shark is on you, just Gate away. For the trash leading up to Harlan, you should almost never kick Painful Motivation because it does a bunch of damage to the mobs. And then if the officer is in that pool, you should always just focus that target down and spread everything off of there. Lastly, kick Thundering Squall off the storm collars if you have a kick, never let it go off. Then for Harlan, the main thing I like to do is set a teleport up somewhere in the room in case you need to escape. Then when you get Cannon Barrage on you, you can count to three and then you move. So the first three shots of the cannon and then start moving. That way your fire is not all over the room. Fear the Grenader if no one's CCing it. 
other than that, this boss is pretty easy. Just blast. All right, next up, Neltharis. This dungeon's a little weird because depending upon how you want to do it as a group, most of the time you're going to be using chains for all the trash. So you kind of need to be a little liberal with your cooldowns, but, you know, be aware of where you're going to be using chains at. There's a lot of great big pulls in here, so, you know, being aware of where you're going to use chains and then being aware of where you can use your cooldowns, it's going to take a little time, but usually the way it works is first pull is chains, second pull is cooldowns, but every group is different. Also, on every pull in here, AoE stops are king, so try and use your Shadow Fury as much as possible and Howl as much as possible. On pulls where you are going to use your cooldowns, I always focus the Thermaturge and then just branch off from there. For first boss, I always like to put my port up against one of the walls on the left of the room because usually if I need to bait charge quickly, I'm baiting it to the left of the room. Always try and bait charge. Every group's different, but I usually go to the left of the room. Be super aware of Volatile Mutation. It does a ton of damage, so be sure to use defensives there whenever you can. Dark Pact is usually up for that. If it's not, Unring Resolve before it is fantastic. For second boss, Chorgath, I like to set my teleport up on the opposite side of the room. So when I get chained, I can easily teleport to the opposite side and then move quickly around wherever I need to get the chain for the tank. For Forge Master, all I really do is just set a teleport up in the back in case you need to quickly get out for Aegis, but that's about it. However, after Forge Master, you can gate back up to the top of the platform. For the trash leading up to the last boss, I like to focus the main bird, and then go from bird into the lava, guys. Follow whatever is marked as skull if it's marked. If it's not, just focus off the bird. For last boss, I like to set my teleport up just in case I need to get out from using the treasure that might suck you in. You can pick up two treasures to use on the shield. But be aware, you can pick up two of the exact same treasure, so you might need to pick up a third. Keep dots on the ad whenever it spawns. Snipe it when it's low for a free shot. Next up, Neltharian's Lair. So at the beginning of this dungeon, there is a little trick you can do, depending on if your group actually has a timer. If you jump four seconds before the key goes in, down the hole, you'll be teleported back down to the hole after the key goes in. The trash in the beginning of this dungeon is super dependent on how your tank pulls it. So try and use your cooldowns if you can, but a lot of times it's very group dependent here, and especially how your tank is pulling. For Rock Mora, I like to try and save my cooldowns for a couple skitterers to build up, and then Soul Rob Vileteen on them, and then just slurp them down to get free shards. But don't let those ads live too long, try and kill them as quickly as possible. After Rock Mora, make sure you always bonk the snail. The trash leading up to Crag Shaper, if it has a breaker in there, I always focus the breaker and just so you can help you watch for avalanches, because you need to pre-move as soon as you see avalanches start being casted so you don't get hit by that and then branch all of your dots off of the breaker. Try and CC the Pelters as much as you possibly can, especially on four weeks because they will probably kill somebody. Or Crag Shaper, not too many tips here. Maybe set a teleport up in case you need to get out immediately. Be careful not to move too quickly before you does Hand of the Mountain. And then try and save Vile Taint and Soul Rod if you can for when the totems are about to drop and slurp them for free shards. For Naraxxus, I like to set my teleport up basically in the middle of the room and then hug the left wall. And then as soon as I get Rancid Maw on me, I can immediately teleport out of the debuff so I don't take any damage from it. Other than that, try and save Vile Taint and Soul Rod for the adds, slurp them down for free shards. For last boss, Dargirl, I like to stay close into melee so that you can spawn Crystal Spikes close. So that way when the boss spawns his add next to him on the left, they'll spawn immediately into Crystal Spikes. Then it'll be stunned instantly, change all your dots over to there. I usually have Haunt on the main target and then just kill it as quickly as possible. Next up, the Vortex Pinnacle. The first pull in this dungeon is terrible, but usually what I do is I just pick a soldier, focus on that, blow that thing up, and then I'll switch over to one of the Mistrals that is just finished casting shield, try and build our dots up on there. But this first pull is pretty much a nightmare no matter what you're playing. After that, for every subsequent pull, I usually just try and focus the soldiers and then burn off and spread from there, and then switch everything to the Mistrals. For first boss, I like to keep Curse of Tongues up at all times, just because that kit cannot go off. I also like to put out at least two Agonies on the adds around the room, just for a little bit of extra free shards. For any of the pulls with a Squall in it or an Assassin, try and always kick Vapor Form if you can, and never let the Squall's Cloud Burst go off here. Shadow Fury and Howl of Terror are fantastic for stopping that. So for Dragon Boss, depending on how good your RNG is, sometimes you can stand in a specific part of the circle and you'll be able to keep the buff without moving. You should use your teleport every time the boss does down burst so that way you don't have to take a tornado to get knocked up, you don't take any extra damage and you just teleport over the edge of it. Stuns and Howl of Terror work on the adepts but they do not work on the executioner so if you want to try and save your stun or your howl to interrupt the greater heal and then use your kick to interrupt the rally. For last boss I like to run soul swap so that I can immediately pull everything off of the boss and throw it right onto the nova and then just blast it. If you soul swap a little before the Nova spawns, it will line up with every single Nova. Other than that, try and use a defensive every time you get Chain Lightning if you can. Dark Pack usually lines up with it pretty well. If not, Soul Burn, Lock Rock, or Resolve. Next up, Oldman. So for the first pull, I like to just focus target the Berserker. 
and then just spread everything from there. For the rest of the pulls, just try and always help with stuns and stops on the Basilisk whenever you can. They have a cast called Chomp that will absolutely wreck your tank. For the Lost Dwarves, I like to usually just pick Olaf as my main target and then just branch all my damage off of that. I also sometimes like to throw a gate up onto the top platform in case you need a quick escape. For Bromac, Bringing the Berserkers into the boss is usually a good idea because they do give a debuff to everything and make it take a lot more damage. But either way, I like to keep all of my main dots on Bromac and then just kind of seed spam uh, as many ads as we can. When the Totem spawns, especially on a Tyrannical, I will usually swap everything over to that and then just blast that as fast as we can. Maybe try and get a shard before it dies, but then go back to just seed spamming and then weaving in Raptures. All right, so for Snake Boss, I like to set my teleport up in the corner of the room. That way, if we get Resonating Orb, we just take it up to boss, drop it on top of each other, and then just teleport quickly out if we need to. Whenever you get the bleed, try and use a defensive if you can. If you're Dwarf, instantly Dwarf Racial that. Outside of that, this boss can be stunned by us to remove stacks, but you really shouldn't have to worry about that. For the trash in the next part of the dungeon, there's, you're going to encounter two types of golems. An Ebonstone Golem and a Runic Protector. They both have casts that you can line of sight, and you should. The Runic Protector casts Fissuring Slam, and the Ebonstone Golem cast thunderous clap and you should try to line sight them whenever you can any poles that have earthen warders in them try and use your stuns as much as you can and kick earthen ward and curse of stone your stuns are fantastic here how of terror also work for the time reaver adds up to the last boss you can line of sight stolen time before it's about to go off so if you're tracking it on your nameplates or however if you wait until the three second mark you can just line of sight it and then you won't get any more stacks and you can just consistently do that throughout the duration of your pull for the stairs on the way to the last boss you can gate up to the right of it and you completely avoid the mobs to the side of it you don't even need soothe or anything you can just go right around them as long as you hug the wall so for last boss there's a few things we can do you should be using your imp to dispel every time sink on yourself or just help your group if you can next you can line of sight every wing buffet around the room on all of the pillars. So try and position yourself in situations where you can line it every single time. It does a ton of damage, so try and reduce that whenever you can. And then get in the time sinks during the rewind and just blast. Last one, Halls of Infusion. For all of the trash in the beginning of this dungeon, anytime there's an apparatus in the pack, that's my main focus target and that needs to die as soon as possible. Use any type of CC you can on it to stop all of its casts whenever you can. Never let Expulse go off. If you have to let anything go off, let the shouts go off. Never let Expulse. For first boss, Watcher Iridius, it's different for every group, but I usually like to set up my teleport somewhere near the middle of the room, so that way when you get the debuff, you can run out and then quickly teleport back in so you don't take a bunch of damage from the debuff. You can also set your gate up so that you can run out and then take your gate immediately back. Whenever he goes into the adds phase, try and wait for them to come up to the boss and then stun them because they do do a bunch of periodic damage to your group. It's a little tricky to get shards off them, but you can get them. For the two mini bosses right outside of Frog Room, Try and wait until Cyrus spawns his Zephyrlings and then use Soul Rot and Vile Taint to try and get a little bit more uptime on those. But keep Amy as your main target, keep Curse of Tongues on there at all times because it does have a heal. You can also try and snipe the Zephyrlings for free shards, but I kind of just weave in between casting seeds here and raptures. For frog boss, always stack in melee so that when the little frogs spawn, they spawn really close to boss. Try and always be aware of them to help keep them in the circle during gulp, whether you need to shout of fury or howl. I like to set my teleport up in the back of the room just in case he does body slam and I need to quickly get away. Or when I'm trying to kite the swaglets, but try and keep those as close to boss as you can so that they all get consumed when he does gulp. For every proto dragon in this dungeon, you can line of sight or outrange deep chill. The first couple you encounter, you cannot line of sight anywhere all the rocks are see-through apparently but you can outrange them if you really really need to but the one at the bottom right before last boss the rock to the right you can line of sight there every deep chill so i like to set my teleport up there just quickly teleport line of sight it make your healer's life a little bit better for frost boss make sure you bait the cyclones away from the good ice blocks i like to stay kind of close to melee just in case so i can move out a little bit from the glacial surge and then move right back in biggest thing to be aware of here is when the ice blocks detonate from her hailstorm, if you are behind a safe one but there's a bad one near you, it can still kill you, so try and be careful of that. For the bridge gauntlet, make sure you never let the Aqua Ragers finish their Tidal Divergence cast because if it goes off, bad things happen. Be sure to also try and always stop the Ice Caller's Refreshing Tides cast. All CC works on these. You can line of sight the Deep Chill from this Proto Dragon on the pillar in the middle of the bridge. Also, all of the lamps on the edges of the room you can stand on to completely avoid being hit by the water. This also works on the run back from the last boss, if you ever need to just tuck in quickly to avoid getting hit by one of the water waves. For the mini boss at the end of the bridge in Fuser Saria, Try and always make sure you kick Aqueous Barrier if you can. But then the big one here is her cast Inundate cannot be line of sighted and cannot be stopped in any way, but it can be outranged. It only has a 30 yard range, 
So we can just sit out of range of it completely and cast and never take any damage from that ability. Tanks like to move this mob around a lot, so try and be very aware of where you're at compared to it and always try and be max range. For last boss, try and always use defensive for Tempest Fury whenever you can. Dark Pack usually lines up very well for it. Avoid Zorkles on the ground, obviously. And then on the run back, feel free to just hide behind the lamps whenever and just find your clearest path to get there as quickly as possible. When you get to the adds, don't ever let the inundates finish if you can. All CC works on these, including hard fears. Lastly, the tank gets knocked away from the boss during this fight, so try not to be too close to melee because the boss can and will melee you. All right, that about wraps it up, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it. This is the first time I've ever made a guide, especially anything like this. So, you know, the support on the YouTube has been crazy. The support on the Twitch has been crazy. So if there's anything I didn't cover in here, be sure to leave a comment, come by the Twitch, ask me any questions, join the Discord, ask me any questions. I'm more than happy to help try and answer. I will do some follow-up guides on this if we need it. And if you guys like this kind of stuff, please let me know. I'm more than happy to do more of these. But until then, I hope to see you guys in the stream, maybe in the Discord. Thank you so much. Thanks for watching.